Hi everyone, Evandro here. Today I want to talk to the aspiring interpreters among you. More specifically, to those of you who say you would love to work as interpreters in the United Nations system. I want to be sure you understand what the language requirements are, so you can know for sure whether or not you qualify in principle. Today I'll be focusing on the language aspect only. I will not discuss admission criteria for freelance or staff interpreters, nor will I talk about any required academic credentials. These will be the subject of another video. For now, let us concentrate on the mechanics of a multilingual UN setup and on how UN interpreters really work. First off, the United Nations has a limited number of official languages, so the first question you gotta ask yourself is this. Am I a native speaker of any of the following six languages? English, French, Spanish, Russian, Arabic, or Chinese? Let me stress the notion of native here. In the UN, interpreters are supposed to work mostly into their mother tongues, also known as a language. So if your main active language is, say, German, Japanese, or Portuguese, opportunities in the UN will be limited for you regardless of how good an interpreter you are. Sorry about that. Now, what other languages do you offer, and how strong are they? Please use the ABC language classification system. A languages are your main active languages. These will usually be your mother tongue or principal language of schooling. A few people can claim two A languages. B languages are foreign languages in which you are fully proficient and comfortable interpreting from as well as into. C languages are foreign languages you are comfortable interpreting from but not into. These are languages you fully understand but don't necessarily speak fluently. You can claim multiple B and C languages, but be conservative in how you classify them for work purposes. Few people are truly bilingual, or double A's, and not every language you speak will qualify for use in the booth. Let us now look at which passive languages are required per booth in the UN. Here's where it gets a bit tricky. In the UN, any English interpreter must be able to interpret directly from French. That is non-negotiable. In addition, the English booth must be able to also work directly from Russian and Spanish to try and minimize relay. If you don't know what relay is, bear with me a couple of slides more. We'll get to it. While interpreters with all the three languages do exist, they are hard to come by. Luckily, with two seats in the booth, it is possible to assemble a team where one colleague has passive French and Russian, and the other one has passive French and Spanish. In that manner, a team can be put together where speeches made in French, Russian, or Spanish can all be rendered seamlessly into English. The exact same situation is replicated in the French booth, only here English must be the common passive language shared by both interpreters. As in the previous case, one of the two interpreters must also have passive Russian and the other passive Spanish. So here's another typical feature of the UN setup. Unless you have passive command of either Russian or Spanish, in addition to English or French, as the case might be, you will not be useful at a multilingual UN meeting. So the take-home point for the English and French booth interpreters out there is obvious. Make sure to add Russian or Spanish to your language combination if you want to be considered. In the case of Spanish or Russian booths, the requirements are less demanding. As an interpreter in one of these booths, you will be working only into Spanish or Russian, as the case may be, and usually you can get by with sound passive knowledge of English and French only. In fact, you can even survive with only one of those languages. Many Russian interpreters interpret only from English. Now, if you're an English or French interpreter and you don't speak neither Russian nor Spanish, not all is lost. You may still be called to service occasional bilingual meetings, in English and French only, in cases where the meeting is serviced from one single two-way booth. These are usually short sittings of no more than 90 minutes. Beyond that, a third colleague will be required. 
In that scenario, there will be no breaks. Interpreters will work both ways for the duration of the meeting. Given the extreme concentration required on the job, interpreters need to take regular breaks to rest and make sure that they will be fully alert when they take the microphone again. In the UN system, interpreters take turn every 30 minutes, and the shifts are governed by the clock, with one colleague starting work at the top of the hour, say at 10 a.m., and the other one taking over at the bottom of the hour, say at 10.30 a.m. As silly as it sounds, this rule must be observed strictly, and here is why. At any given point in time during a conference, the English and French booths need to be able to respond in case anybody speaks Russian or French. With interpreters taking turns, and sometimes leaving the booth during their breaks, you want to make sure that there will be at least one interpreter with passive Russian and one with passive Spanish in the English and French booths at all times. The only way to ensure this is to have the entire team operate against one same parameter, in this case, the clock. Still a bit confusing if you're dealing with this for the first time, I know, but I hope it makes more sense now. Moving on to Arabic and Chinese now, and here is where it gets a bit complicated. For the most part, interpreters in the Arabic or Chinese booths work only from one foreign language, either English or French. These colleagues will take turns accordingly and will render into Arabic or Chinese, as the case may be, whatever they hear in English or French. Now what happens when the delegate speaks Arabic or Chinese on the floor? Well, in that case, the Arabic or Chinese interpreters must work in the opposite direction, rendering the speech into English or French for the benefit of everybody else on the team, since no one else understands those languages. At that moment, colleagues in the other booths will no longer listen to the delegate directly. Rather, they will switch their incoming channels to English or French, and will work from the English or French speech rendered by their colleagues in the Arabic or Chinese booth. That is the reason why the Arabic and Chinese booths are staffed with three interpreters instead of two. Because unlike the other booths, which take a break whenever their language is in use on the floor, the Arabic and Chinese colleagues work non-stop, either into their mother tongue or into English or French. Now that's the system known as Relay, when a common language known to all members on the team is used as a temporary bridge whenever one doesn't understand the language being spoken on the floor. Let us illustrate it using the Arabic booth as an example again. If a delegate speaks Arabic on the floor, the Arabic interpreters will render that speech into English for the benefit of his colleagues in the other booths, who do not understand Arabic. Working from that English version, the French booth will work into French, the Spanish booth into Spanish, the Russian booth into Russian, and the Chinese booth into Chinese. And since the speech is already being rendered into English by the colleague in the Arabic booth, the English booth interpreters need not work at this point. The same would be true of French if the Arabic interpreter were speaking French instead. While relay is most common whenever Arabic and Chinese are spoken, the Russian and Spanish booths resort to it often too depending on the passive languages of colleagues in those booths. So that pretty much summarizes the linguistic requirements that one must be aware of when coming to work for the UN. Not as straightforward as one would think, I gather. Well, I hope to have raised your awareness about where you need to work and which languages you may need to add in case you're serious about landing a job with the UN as an interpreter. For more such career insights, sign up to my website, follow me on Twitter, or read my articles in LinkedIn. I am Evandro Magalhães, conference interpreter, writer, chief interpreter, interpreter, trainer, and mentor. I have walked in your shoes, and I can help you walk in mine. Thank you for watching. Feel free to share.